Theatre. It's weird, isn't it? There's my background as theatre, and they judge it so much more harshly because theatre has it's more rooted in words, the tradition of yeah, I suppose it's the tradition of language. I wrote something in intelligent here earlier. <laughs> yes. Yes, right, I'll have to read it out. Dance finds a language in the bodies it is given to work with. Theatre prescribes the language and is far more rooted in traditional methods of delivery, presenting more difficult barriers to inclusion. I didn't write that, and my, my administrator at work helped me with that. I must say thank you to her. But on that note, just thinking about theatre, Gail, can you come here? I'm just going to read something, and my partner in crime is Gail Mellis. This is from a play called Whiter Than Snow by a writer called Mike Henning. And it's around, um, it centres around the retelling of a Snow White story from the perspective of people of short stature. It's also about Mengele, the Holocaust, eugenics, which was seven year old plus stuff. But if you can imagine, I'm a man, probably about 50, a man of short stature. Then is a young woman, about 20, and a woman of short stature. I am the director of the Snow White story and very much interested in Snow White and the seven dwarves. She is my daughter, Ashley will play a dwarf. Here we go. <coughs> Our show is not a beautiful show, it's a funny show. We make people laugh, that's what we do. And you will never be Snow White. Why not? You're a dwarf. A dwarf? Dad, it's only pretend. I'm an actress. I'm not really a dwarf. Dwarfs live in little cottages in the forest and deep in the mines. <laughs> and in case you haven't noticed, we don't. Don't you get clever with me, young lady. As far as the pandas are concerned, you're a dwarf. You are not, and never will be, Snow White. Why not? Because people will laugh. They won't. They have been laughed at us for thousands of years, and they're not going to stop now. They don't. Frida, you walk down the street, they laugh. At least here, we take their money for doing it. Why can't I be Snow White? It isn't going to happen. Not in my show. <laughs> but why can't she be Snow White? It doesn't. As when I'm, I, I direct that play, I'm going around talking to young people, doing a workshop around the issues in the play. All the kids, disabled, deaf, and non-disabled kids, all said, "But." Why can't she play Snow White? It doesn't say in the book that Snow White has to be tall or short. Kids get it. They really do get it. They are as open as a book, and that's what we need to remember. We were like that maybe many years ago, and then as we get older, things start to change. But my point is, in the world of theatre, acting is about being somebody else. We can be somebody else. Anyway, I've lost my guess. No, and one of my sort of uh, my hobby horses is Shakespeare. I mean, I know Shakespeare talks very much about Richard III and Caliban, but he didn't say, did he, whether Juliet was a wheelchair user or not a wheelchair user? So there you go. And I think therein lies our excellence. We are never ashamed of who we are. We have a unique ability to communicate on many levels, which does pitch fear into the consciousness and exposes the personal battle of prejudice, but we constantly, constantly challenge the status quo. We establish our own sense of normal into the territory, and therefore I think that's what makes us extraordinary. You know, I wanted to call this paper the AT, Value added tax because we add value my god we do and we tax your sensibilities oh please love i thought that was absolutely good <laughs> <good. laughs> 
What has been extraordinary in the UK is all the disabled artists and different companies that I have been working with, all of us are like absolutely committed to, to ensuring that our work is accessible. So we, even if we've got a small grant, we will make sure that it's audio described, we'll make sure it's interpreted, we'll make sure it's an accessible venue. We have such a commitment. And actually, I don't think any other community that really fights for access for them as actors, us as actors, and also our audiences. So that brings me to that thing about can access, can we have excellence in relationship to access? Yes. Otherwise, it's an absolute infringement of human rights. And I think all of us, everyone in this room is an artist or engaged in some sort of a creative, creative wherewithal, yes? No, obviously not. <laughs> Let's just imagine you all are. But the arts world is not just a ramp. It's not just an induction loop. It's much more than that. So when I go to the theatre, I want to have the full theatrical experience. This is brilliant. We're next to each other. So for, for Ross, he can do that a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> we should be a bit near, but... But at least I'm in the framework. When I, sometimes when I go to the theatre, right far over there where the big yellow door is in this room, the interpreter might be over there. So if you imagine, do you know Sarah Kane? She's a writer, and every other word is either the C word or the F word. It's filth, basically. But <laughs> if the interpreter is way, way over the other side of the stage and all the acting is happening the opposite side of the stage, every time a swear word occurs, the entire hearing side of the audience will look to see how it's signed. Of course I will. I'll teach you some tomorrow. But, um, but it's really distracting, all these people moving their heads like a tennis match. But the only place I have to look is interpreted by that yellow, that yellow door. That's not access. I want to see what's happening over there. And if they're doing all those things, my God, I also want to see that. <laughs> But it's the same. I mean, Payne's Plough, a fantastic company, there's this play called um, The Straits. And uh, we have four young, energetic people, really, really going for it. The interpreter, fabulous woman, old enough to be their grandmother, and really didn't like the play. <laughs> didn't like some of the language in the play, so she was just signing it as if she was excruciatingly embarrassed. <laughs> so I was having to watch that, not being able to focus on these young actors. It's the same thing. If you have an all-female cast and you have a male audio describer, it changes the nature of the, the experience. How a man would audio describe a piece with all women is very different from how a woman would describe something with an all-female cast. And it's the same with ethnicity. You know, my friend Jen, who's a fantastic interpreter, she was the only white face in an all-black cast. And I said, Jen, you shouldn't have accepted that job. And she, she now thinks, oh, God, no, absolutely. So we are desperately trying to train up more, more ethically diverse interpreters so that we cast sign language interpreters in the same way that we cast audio describers. So that means that the value of the experience I get of going to the theatre is almost the same as a non-disabled person. Do you see what I mean? We've got a long way to go on that, but... We've been lucky because the Arts Council in England, and Sue will be talking much more about the Arts Council tomorrow, but the Arts Council have invested massively, both financially, emotionally, and through advocacy, in saying that we have to have an equal playing field. And that's us as artists, as leaders, as policy makers, as decision makers, and as audiences and that we have to have the equal rights to have the whole experience. 
So I'm actually really, really proud now because we are sort of like everywhere. It's getting really exciting. It's bloody competitive though. Not sure I like that. But <laughs> we've got Heart of Soul, big, big uh, learning disabled ensemble. They've just had their first ever uh, solo CD, CD out. And Pino Fomento, one of their earliest, earliest members, has just had an MBE. They're at the South Bank, they're at Latitude Festivals, they are everywhere. Kanduko always perform at the South Bank. Grey Eye, for the first time, is going to be performing outside the National Theatre. That's me, not me, but my gang. And over the years, we've got Extant, which is a blind led organised theatre company. Definitely, just deaf lad. Julie McNamara, who's a solo performer. Liz Carr, who's a solo performer, and others have been given regular funding from the Arts Council. So it means they can just take stock and be artists rather than struggling for money, struggling for recognition. They've been recognised. The Arts Council have given them the money. They're out there doing it.